Um, I'm going to try to convince you of something today which I think will be difficult. I shall probably fail in that endeavor. Um, not least because I think often we need some kind of crisis to make ourselves think differently about the world, um, to look at it afresh and throw away our preconceptions. And I say that because uh, I had a crisis myself to go through that process. In my favor is the fact that I think we may be in a period of crisis right now, certainly an environmental crisis, an economic crisis of a concentration of wealth in the hands of a few, and of course a political crisis, which is all too evident in the rise of populism, nationalism, society divided against itself. My own crisis happened uh, 15 years ago. I used to believe in the Western model. I used to believe that free markets, lightly regulated, were the best way to bring wealth and flourish, allow everybody to flourish. I used to believe that small groups of people representing the whole, so-called representative democracy, was the best way to govern, the best way to bring peace, stability to our society. I was once a member of that small group. I was a British diplomat. I worked on many things. I ended up working on Iraq and its chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. My crisis came to a head when I realized my government had been telling lies about the things that I had worked on. I ended up testifying in secret to an official inquiry into the war, and after great personal torment and anguish, I decided to resign from the British Foreign Office. But my crisis had been building for some time before that. Uh, as a diplomat, I had been writing speeches for my ambassadors and for my foreign secretary, uh, telling the world how we had it under control, how government could manage the world, the problems in front of us, we could fix them. But when I looked out of my window, I saw something different. I saw inequality rising, I saw the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere increasing rapidly. Uh, I saw, particularly after 9-11, which I witnessed, I saw growing instability and what seems to be now perpetual war. So that summer of 2003, I sat back uh, a little lost and I tried to figure it out. In government, we had a tendency to place patterns upon the world and seek the evidence to justify those patterns. The opposite, if you like, of scientific method. Worse, people believed us. In a sense, we were making it up. So what I tried to do was go out to the world and look at it afresh, what was actually going on, and start from that, and try to derive an economics and politics from those observations. What do we see in the world? We see billions of actors in a constant process of action and reaction and counter-reaction. Uh, it, it is not order, it is not chaos, it is something in between. This is the definition of a complex system, of complexity. I read and read. Um, one night, I was sitting with my little daughter at about three in the morning, uh, she was awake. We were watching pay TV uh, on our sofa, and there was an advert for a course in complexity theory. And I looked at the, the advert and I thought, that looks interesting, I bought the, bought the course. Complexity theory tells us a number of things about the world. First of all, it's impossible to understand uh, the com a complex system from the top down. It's constantly dynamic, there are far too many moving pieces. If you take a snapshot of it at one moment, it's already changed. This means it's very difficult to understand that system. None of us can truly understand it, let alone a government looking from the top trying to manage that system. It makes it very, very difficult, if not impossible, to manage. This means, for one thing, that change is unpredictable in that system. If you pull a lever at one end of the system, as a government might, with a policy, you can't predict the outcome at the other end of that system of what that policy might produce. It's unpredictable. But by contrast, also in such a system, change can come from an, an individual agent or a small group of agents. In fact, 
they may, they may be the most effective motor of change rather than a great big government. We're used to thinking we have to be big, but in fact, we can be very small. A single agent in a complex system can trigger change when that complex system is prime for change, so-called criticality. It can a single ag agent can trigger change in the whole system. If you think of Mohamed Bouaziz, for example, the young man in Tunisia, whose singular act of setting fire to himself brought revolution in Tunisia and across the Arab world, the Arab Spring, but also counter-reaction, repression in Egypt, and of course, mass murder by the Assad regime in Syria. This is a different model of change. In complex systems, it is impossible to create stability from the top down. In fact, if you try to control that system to create order, you are as likely to create disorder at the end. But in a complex system, order is plausible. It is feasible through the actions of individual agents, us, individuals, cooperating together, um, collaborating to create things, to organize ourselves, to organize our society. Um, it's a deeper, more endemic, inherent order I would suggest more resilient. When I realized this about complexity in the world, um, I suddenly realized that what it means, of course, is that change is up to us. We can no longer look to others, authority, to do things for us. When I realized this, I found it profoundly upsetting. It turned my model of politics literally on its head. Um, I was very uh, anguished by this revelation. And the more I read, the more I realized that, in fact, others had come to these conclusions earlier in the 19th century. Um, and this philosophy uh, had a name. And I realized that by deduction rather than by conviction, I had actually come to believe, uh, almost by accident, in anarchism. Uh, Emma Goldman, uh, the likes of Pyotr Krop Kropotkin in Russia, 19th century anarchist, believed that you could only have government for the people when it was by the people. They rejected communism. And I think if they were around today, they would argue that anarchism is more relevant than ever. And I would suggest to you that it is, in fact, essential if we're going to solve the problems in front of us. But what is anarchism? I hear you cry. Or maybe not. <laughs> uh, 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 well, first of all, anarchism doesn't tell us that things will be all, all right in the end. Both communism and capitalism have in common this idea that it's all going to be OK if we keep doing it. We go through the pain now, eventually it's going to be good for everybody. Anarchism doesn't pretend that. It doesn't offer a blueprint for a utopian society, which, by the way, is inherently fascistic. Anarchism is a process. It is action. It is collaboration with people without power uh, without people having power over one another, collaboration as equals, everybody included uh, in decision-making. It is work, um, unlike voting. Though I would, I'm sure you agree that our current political system, with politicians trading simplistic, vulgar slogans about what to do about the world, and electoral politics and partisanship that seems to be more successfully dividing us than uniting us, the political system that we have today is more part of the problem than the, than the solution. Anarchists propose instead direct democracy. This means everybody involved in the decisions that affect them. This was democracy as practiced in ancient Greece, where citizens took it in turns to take the decisions for the city. But more recently, direct democracy has been practiced by tens of thousands of people in a large city in Brazil called Porto Alegre, where thousands of people took part in debates to decide the priorities for the city budget. After 10 years of this, the World Bank, of all people, did a study of the results, and the results were extraordinary. Though perhaps predictable, if you think about it, if you include rich and poor alike in decision-making, the outcomes of those decisions are going to be more equitable. And sure enough, when the World Bank looked at Porto Alegre, they found that things like sanitation, healthcare, and education were, were much more fairly distributed than they had been before this experiment in participatory democracy began. They also found, interestingly, that both politics, 
the ugly form, partisanship and corruption all dramatically declined, which again makes sense because if politicians are not allowed secretly to carve up a budget and pay off their cronies, why do you need political parties at all? You just decide. Anyway, uh, it works. This is a system um, that has been proven. It's not a wild idea. Anarchism isn't chaos. People think, oh, it just means you know, everything, a free-for-all. It's not that at all, that at all. But you can't have a fair politics when power and wealth is concentrated in the hands of a few. The wealthy, those already with wealth and power, will always get access to the decision makers. They will always be able to reach those policy makers more easily than the rest of us. You have to create a fair economy. Anarchists do not propose state ownership as the answer. They propose instead that everybody who contributes to an enterprise should be a beneficiary of that enterprise. They should be an owner of that enterprise. They should have a say in the future of that enterprise. This is, of course, the cooperative model. And again, it works. Spain's 10th largest company is a conglomerate, a cooperative called Mondragon. In Britain, its longest lasting retail store uh, was founded when the family owner uh, of a collection of stores realized that his family was worth more and was earning more than all of the company's employees put together. Disgusted, he turned the company, John Lewis, into a cooperative. This happened when he was lying in bed, injured after a horse riding accident, his own kind of rupture. I've seen these models work in small villages, in neighborhoods of New York City, in cities, big cities, also in a uh, remarkable region of eastern Syria called Rojava, where after the collapse of the Assad regime, they have implemented self-government from the bottom up, including all ethnicities, races, where women are always given leadership roles, chair every meeting, uh, where decisions are made at the lowest level possible, where even in decisions of justice and wrongdoing, they do not look to authority to make the decisions to punish. They look to the group, society, to decide what is best, what is the best way to deal with their problems together. Um, this produces something extraordinary. Uh, this produces society that is fairer, uh, that is better, uh, where there is more cooperation, less division, uh, more harmony, more love. But this won't happen on its own. No politician will legislate for this kind of society to, to arise. It will have to be built and tended to constantly. It's not something that we can just expect to happen through the dialectic of history. And indeed, the dialectic of history tells us that things change. Nothing can be taken for granted. It's pretty clear that the current dispensation that left us very comfortable in the late 20th century of representative democracy and a kind of capitalism, that dispensation is coming to an end. And the question is, what will replace it? And it's pretty clear what will replace it right now, and it's not pretty. And unless we act, that will continue to be our future. There's something deeper here, too. The conception of the human in current contemporary orthodox economics and politics is of somebody who can't be trusted. You need governments to set down rules, to coerce them, to punish them if they do wrong. It posits the human as individual, consumer, materialist, somebody who protects their own rather than uh, protects their own against the threats from outside. I profoundly believe that this is a grotesquerie. It's a travesty of what we are. If you ask the dying soldiers, what they will tell you is that they live for other people. They will sacrifice their lives for other people. In a sense, they only exist in other people. So for me, anarchism has become much more than a merely political or economic philosophy. It's become uh, a guide to how to live. And with that, I'll sit down and turn the rest to you.